I'm Kai Rizzo. Welcome back to Make Me Smart, where we make today make sense. It is Friday, today, November the 10th. And I know it sounds like Kai's talking through a tunnel, but he's really okay. We're just having some audio issues. But anyway, I'm Kimberly Adams on my very nice microphone. Uh, (laughs) And thank you, everyone, for joining us on Friday for our weekly happy hour, Economics on Tap. And yeah, we're glad to have you here. And and Kai, we're glad to have you here, despite the technical difficulties. Despite everything. Yeah, so I, I think it's that the rats chewed through my cable that leads out to the shed. That's what I really think. But um, I guess we'll see. Anyway, um, we will do, uh, even though the sound quality is terrible, uh, we will do some news. uh, We'll do uh, a game uh, and then we'll get you on your way. Uh, Before we get to it, though, what are you drinking today? What are you drinking today? So I'm trying something new, which is this cocktail, more or less called a 50-50 or a Rhinar, and it's half of um, bourbon, so not rye, actually, half bourbon, half artichoke uh, liquor, uh, like an Amaro. It's called Chinar, I think, Um, but I had some that I got for a cocktail I was making at one point. And then I've had it, and so I've just been looking for cocktails to make with it. And then it was a little too bitter for me, so I added some pomegranate juice, and it's delicious. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. What you uh, I am I am having what will be the first of several because it has been a week. Uh, Chainsaw bunnies. Oof. From from Paperback Brewing here in Los Angeles. Uh, I was out for dinner the other night uh, with my wife and another couple, and we drove right by the brewery and. Okay, this is more than you need to know. But he and I had already had a couple, and he said, "Hey, you want to go to you want to go to Paperback Brewing?" And I'm like, "No, man, I got a soccer game at eight o'clock. I got to get up." Anyway, uh, Bunny with a Chainsaw, Paperback Brewing here in Los Angeles, eight point two percent ABV, excellent beer, uh, and I uh, I will relax into my afternoon and evening here in Los Angeles. You deserve so, it. You deserve yeah, it. There we go. All right, let there me see go. what folks are drinking over on the Fan Run Discord. And you want to check the YouTube chat? I will take the YouTube chat. Here we go. Uh, Old Orchard Crisp Apple Cider for Jennifer Flippin Pierce. Uh, Fixty is having Celebrator Double Bach. Uh, let's see. There's some hot cider going on. God, I got to tell you guys. Just like oh, speaking of cider... Of Yes, what? It actually started getting cold here. Uh, today it was kind of rainy and dreary. But Denise is drinking a Sizer Spritzer, which is homemade fermented hard cider and orange blossom mead with club soda. Good job, Denise. I see you with that Very effort. Great. That's great. That's uh, great. Tim is drinking a St. Arnold Art Car IPIA. <laughs> I don't know if that was a typo or if an IPIA is a real thing. Um, let's see. <laughs> Meredith is drinking cheap red wine. I am here for for it. I like Ryan drinking water. Um, John is drinking athletic run wild non-alcoholic IPA. Athletic uh, non-alcoholic beers are, athletic, are pretty popular here in D.C. A- athletic, super popular out here, too. I think I've talked about this before. I really like it um, in the mouth in the beginning. And then the finish tastes mm-hmm. like wet cardboard, and it ruins it for me. It's, it bums me out, too, because I could really use a, a, a zero ABV beer just to, to have it because, you know. I, I feel like it's coming. Anyway. Like, all these products are getting so much better. I do think, yeah. like, like, I've found non-alcoholic tequilas I really like, non-alcoholic bourbons I really like, whereas five years ago when I looked, they were awful. Um, there's some non-alcoholic or de-alcoholized red wines that I actually like now. Yeah. And I just feel like the tech is making all this stuff get better. So, so do you know whether it's de-alcoholized? It's got to be de-alcoholized, right? If it's a spirit, because they can't like make it without. Yeah, alcohol. I think. Well, some of them are. So some of them they just like infuse herbs and things like that. But others they like make the spirit and then they remove the alcohol. But others I think are just like blends of, you know, mood enhancing boosters and things like that. And yeah. like the shrubs or whatever. Right. You know, but most of it's dealcoholized. Yeah. Uh right. okay. Uh shall we do some news? What you got? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Uh am I gonna go first? Okay. Uh, yeah. So look, um, uh, I am. Uh-huh. So I, uh, hmm. I don't want to be a downer, but here's where I'm going to go. I despair for this country, and I despair for this country for a lot of reasons. But the reason I mostly despair for this country is that the leading uh, Republican candidate 
for president, who will more likely than not win the nomination, says stuff like this about his Justice Department. He says, if I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say, go down and indict them. Mostly what that would be, you know, they would be out of business. They'd be out. They'd be out of the election. And and it troubles me that that's not a 72-point headline in the New York Times, that it doesn't lead every NPR newscast and every network news show and CNN all over the place. We have become numb to the dystopia that the Republican Party and its leader presents, and that really troubles me. And, and you know, there will be there may be people who will say, oh, you're being partisan and you're a journalist and you can't do that. I, I will not stand down in the face of threats to democracy so we can have that conversation. Um, but if the, the idea that this didn't get more play than it's getting is crazy making. Sorry. I often just, think you know. of a conversation I had with my grandmother in 2016. And I'm not going to say how old my grandmother is, but suffice it to say, she remembers the lead up to and the actions of World War II with great clarity. And she said to me in 2016 that the way the media was covering Donald Trump reminded her of the way the American press covered Adolf Hitler um, leading up to World War II. Because she said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but I'll, I remember the conversation clearly. She said, everyone knew what he was doing. Everybody, he was saying what he was going to do, but nobody believed him. Everyone thought he was so charismatic and just dismissed the things he was saying. And everybody sat back and just watched what he was doing until it was too late. And she said that to me in 2016 because you know she knows i work in media and it was a chastisement mm -hmm. and she said everybody believes that it can't get that bad but it can mm -hmm. and this is exactly what it looked like back then and yeah. that chilled me to the bone at the time and it still does actually and this is a conversation we're gonna have to have you know there's no way you can avoid in this environment getting the label of being partisan while also standing up for democracy. Because unfortunately, right. that's where our polarization right. has landed us. You're and either on the side of democracy, and unfortunately, that means you're saying a lot of negative things about one section of our political landscape, um, or you try to pretend like it's a false equivalency, and then you know, right. you're diminishing the real danger. It, 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 uh, it troubles me so deeply. So look, I actually just going down into the YouTube chat here from Sarah Mann or Mahan, or I'm sorry, I'm probably pronouncing your name wrong, Sarah. She says, not a fan of Trump, but I am a Republican yet. I listen to every episode of this show. So I appreciate you not being a fan of Trump and I appreciate you being a Republican and I appreciate you listening to this program, this show, but, 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 well, what do we do with a party that has become, and I use this word advisedly, unhinged, where its its base and its most most of its elected representatives are election deniers or worse? There is a core of the old Republican Party which is still there, and I guess I just wonder how. Number one, what do we do with that? And number two, I wonder how long it is actually until we have three major parties in this country, right? The, the Democrats who have a challenge on the progressive left, but are mostly hanging together, the what used to be Republicans, and then the Trumpists, mm -hmm. you know? And the people uh, who know. are sort of the traditional Republicans, they're just tapping out. You oh, know, I know. Um, you've got Mitt Romney over here trying desperately yep. to convince Joe Manchin not to run third party. Um, and all of these Republican senators uh, and and members of the House who are sort of the old guard saying, you know what, there there is no place for us. Um, but what what are they to do? I mean, you speak up against Trump, you get primaried out and the party becomes more extreme. Um, so, yeah, it's it's grim.
And I think that puts the responsibility of our job uh, in even more stark relief um, in the coming year. Yep. But we're doing our yep. best and we're going to continue to do that. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, wait, yeah. sorry, before you go on, what just, just Sarah Mahone, or I'm sorry, Sarah, ne- next time you put something in the chat, tell me how to pronounce your name. She, she says, <laughs> I honestly think there are a lot of us Republicans who can't find a place for ourselves. And, and I hear that. I hear yeah. that. Anyway, I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh, it's your turn. Go ahead. But you know what? It's, it's, it's the official celebrated Veterans Day. So yeah. you get the longest rant you like today. Well, there you go. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> thank, that. Thank you. I appreciate that. So speaking of which, what's your take on thank you for your service? Oh, that's so interesting. I, you know, so I, um, <clears throat> uh, I am deeply proud of my military service. It defines me, as I think I've said on this podcast to this day. Uh, I find great value in it, and I think it's a real challenge for the society that there is such a divide between the civilian and the military. Something Mm -hmm. like 6% of Americans are veterans, and that means that 94% of Americans don't really understand what it means to deploy and to have the challenges challenges that come with service, full stop. I also think that the hagiography of the American veteran, the raising up of us as paragons, mostly paragons of virtue, and people who have done selfless things and people who have sacrificed, which a lot of us have, not me, I was a non-combat veteran, um, is a little bit distorted. So when people say to me, thank you for your service, I say, thank you, I appreciate it. And that's about it. Look, you have to know that I didn't really do anything in my service, right? It was peacetime. Um, uh, I, 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 I had a great time in my military service. I was not traumatized. I was not PTSD. I had... There was nothing bad about my service at all. Um, But I really wish we would spend more time thinking about what it means that so small, such a small slice of the American public bears, uh, sorry, uh, not the American public, such a small slice of the American citizenry bears the burden that comes with military service uh, without so much of the rest of the country really being aware of it. That's it. Is there something better to say or, or even better to do than a thank you for your service? Well, so look, other that's, than that's, not that's, using it as a shopping holiday. That, that, right. That, that's, that's a little tough, right? Because, um, uh, y- yes. So yeah, there is right. I mean, I mean, look, so I was, an officer, which number one meant mm-hmm. I had the education going in and I had an easier time physically in the service. I was an aviator uh, assigned to an aircraft carrier, which meant that when we had general quarters drills and the ship's crew was fighting the ship, it literally was my job. It was my duty station to go to my bunk room and basically sit in my bunk and do nothing. So I slept. Um, uh, and, and when I got out, I had means and support. But think about an 18-year-old uh, Marine from Ottumwa, Iowa. And she goes into the service out of high school because she's looking for direction or something else to do, or she wants to serve. And for whatever or reason... for her college to be paid for. Or, or, or for her college to be paid for, right? Which is, which is a, a great a and valid reason draw to do when that. I was a young she, person. A, absolutely. I'm not sure if it is so much anymore. Maybe it is. I don't know. But anyway, but mm-hmm. yes. So whatever the motivation is, she goes in the Marine Corps. And then she gets out three or four years later and maybe college doesn't work out. If it does, awesome. And that's great. But if not, the challenge for her is to find her place in a civilian society when everything for four years has been regimented. When I got out of the service, I was 20. uh, Well, I'd had foreign service in between, but, but I was 30 ish. Right. And I literally didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And my wife who was, amazingly supportive through all of this but trying to embark on her own career after our path in the foreign service didn't kind of know what to do with me and so we went together to job counselors and people who would help me find my way and and none of it really resonated because i couldn't articulate what it was that i wanted to do in part because for years eight years of my life it was all programmed and and there for me um, we're way off the beaten path on this podcast, but, uh, but, um, I, I really think 
that the best thing we can do for veterans is, of course, support them while they're in the service, but more significantly support them as they try to make that transition out, right? Because, mm -hmm. because that's the really hard part. Boot camp sucks. And deploying for six months on an aircraft carrier is lousy. And going to a land war in Southeast Asia is way worse. Um, but trying to regroup from that and recover to a civilian life is really, really hard. Okay. Somebody in the chat said better than um, thank you for your service is just asking a vet how they're doing. How, how they're doing, right? And, and so I thought of that. I thought of that. And, mm -hmm. and, and for, so for peacetime veterans or for non-combat veterans like me, that's a little like, I'm fine. Why do you ask? And for the, the, for the people who really had difficult service, that might be tricky. I don't, I literally don't know. <laughs> and they'd be like, what's your, it's not your business, you know, um, right, right. you know, it, it's like right. how much, and like, in fact, I have a traumatic brain injury and I can't get my VA benefits on time, Right, right. you know, right. Yep. Uh, all right. So all this to say, be mindful when you're throwing around those thank you for your services this weekend to put a little thought yeah. behind it. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. I'm going to hit my news item real quick um, because it actually relates back to the top of the show and um, the polarization and, and dysfunction in Congress, because as you probably saw um, this afternoon, Moody's Investor Services Le Moody's Investors Service, aka just Moody's, cut its outlook on the U.S. Uh, ratings to negative from stable, yeah. pointing to risks, I'm reading from CNBC, pointing to risks to the nation's fiscal strength, and I'm going to scroll down here, continued political polarization within Congress raises the risk that successive governments will not be able to reach consensus on a fiscal f plan to slow the decline in debt in debt affordability. Um, <laughs> it does expect the U.S. to retain its exceptional economic strength, but this is what we, everyone has predicted would happen. And because of the dysfunction in Congress over um, the inability to pass spending bills, the, in, the debt limit scare and everything else, I did want to flag that this week also um, Joe Manchin and Mitt Romney, you know, the buddies, uh, introduced the Bipartisan Fiscal Stability <laughs> Act. Um, this, and I'm just reading from uh, Manchin's press release here. The legislation would create a bicameral, that's both bodies of Congress, bicameral fiscal commission tasked with finding legislative solutions to stabilize and decrease the national debt, which now exceeds $33.6 trillion, more than double what it was just 10 years ago. And then it goes on to talk about all the co-sponsors in the Senate and that the legislation is a companion to the House's Bipartisan Fiscal Commission Act, which was introduced by Representatives Bill Hu Huizinga, I'm so sorry, uh, and Scott Peters. Anyway, this is something that lots of the groups who pay very close attention to the national debt have been calling for, that we need some sort of fiscal commission to come up with solutions. We were talking about this uh, earlier this week. There are solutions on the table that would make a, a dent, that would stabilize things, but the getting the political will behind them is going to be hard. Um, there have been other fiscal commissions in the past. Uh, the Green uh, Cato Institute pointed out the Greenspan Commission, which did not go so well when they attempted to work on that. But you know what? This has bipartisan, bicameral support. There seems to be some movement on it, and I think it's it's worth watching. That's all. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. That is it. Yeah. That's all my news. All right. So we're done. Uh, and, and once again, I apologize for the lag and I apologize for me being on zoom, you know, the rats ate my cord. That's, that's my, that's my defense. And I, I get to spend a story. This you're sticking to it. I get to spend this weekend buying a new 100 foot uh, uh, cat five cable. Anyway, uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, and then we're going to do half full, half empty when we come back, which will be soon. Yes, half full, half empty. Welcome back. It is time to play our game, uh, which is hosted by our very own Drew Drostad. And Drew, take it away. All right. According to a new survey from Intuit, 
that claims that quality of life is more important to Generation Z than is saving for retirement. The Ooh. marketing label on this is a soft saving. I'm not sure about that one. Are you half full or half empty? That's very interesting. I'm going to let you go. I'm first. half empty because I feel like it's, um, it's, it comes from a place of resignation. I think a lot of folks in Gen Z and millennials just believe that retirement is not a real option for us and that we will never be able to save enough to stop working. And so you may as well just try to have your little wins along the way. And I think that's what this is. And it's kind of, it is depressing. So there's that. Yeah, I agree with Kimberly. Are, are you, but you're a millennial. I am old one, but okay. you know, yes, yeah, technically. Yeah, okay. I, I'm a very young, I'm the youngest actually baby boomer. Uh, and mm. my mother, who is a warrior, uh, <laughs> has said to me increasingly as I have uh, 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 approached closer than I would care to be the traditional retirement age, um, she always says to me, Kai, there's so much time. There are so many hours in a day. Uh, and so uh, while I appreciate that that it's, you know, doubtful that Social Security is going to be here, it actually will, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, don't don't give up on, on the later part of your life. I know it's tough to see it at 25 or 30 or 35 or 40, but it's going to be there and you got to deal with it. So... I also had this feeling of like, I would love to keep being a journalist until the day I die. Let me go out like Dan Shore doing stuff right, right, right until right, right, right. Um, up until I leave. However, I have lived a life of work that is not hard on my body. And it is one thing when your working career is labor at a desk and you can get like, you know, repetitive injuries and all these other things. But if you were a construction worker, or if you right. were worked in food service most of your life, if you were a nurse and that prospect of having to continue working, you're going to get to an age where your body doesn't let you work anymore. Yeah. And then those long years start to look a lot more scary. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's, that's a big concern. Totally fair. Totally fair. All right. What's the next one now that we've next. just destroyed hope for the future? Yeah, no joke. Right? This is kind of a this kind of a downer podcast. Sorry, everybody. Hey, welcome to the new folks. <laughs> Are you <laughs> happy for coming on? Or have empty on hot desking. Oh, uh, so this is a story that I think Stephanie Hughes did for the radio show yesterday about uh, companies basically uh, cutting back on real estate space and, and not wanting to deal with, you know, huge numbers of empty desks now that people aren't coming to work. So for those who are coming to work, um, you don't actually have a workstation. You uh, go wherever there's a, an empty desk and somebody will come in right behind you and somebody will be have have been there right before you will. Uh, it's, it's a little weird, but look, work is changing. Work is changing. And the idea of having an office or a desk of your own, I think kind of goes away. So I, I'm neutral. It is what it is. Um, half, I'm, I'm going to go neutral because I'm half full in that, you know, it means we can potentially make better use of that space eventually. I know it's expensive to convert office buildings into housing, but we need the housing. So hopefully it'll work out. Um, companies using only what they need, but half empty because some people are really gross at their desks and I don't want to touch what they do. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> okay, what's next? All right. A new strategy announcement from Starbucks has a goal to build 17,000 more stores by 2030. Are you half full or half empty? <sighs> I don't even know. Half empty. I'm just straight Go half ahead. empty. We have enough Starbucks. That's it. Yeah, I, I think that's We do have enough Starbucks. That's for bleeping short. Yeah. That's what all about I got. in China, though? Do they have enough Starbucks in China? Well, wow. maybe not, but well, so you know what's really interesting? I saw some piece the other day about how the Chinese are now getting very much getting into um coffee culture where they've been a mm. tea society for for you know millennia. Um, so 
but look, if you're going to be a coffee culture, don't be a Starbucks culture. There's better coffee than Starbucks. Don't hate me. Don't at me. Yeah, I, I I'm not great on coffee. It makes me shake because <laughs> I'm a tea person. So too much coffee is never a good thing for me. All yeah. right. Uh, is this the last one? I got two more. If you if you got two time. more. OK, yeah. let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Next story comes from Rolling Stone. A24 is developing an Elon Musk biopic oh, with God. Aaron Aronofsky oh, God. directing. Oh, God. Oh, God. It's like Sorry. eyes half full. Oh, God. Come He's on. Come on. He's buying his tickets in advance. I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> He's I mean, a calendar what? reminder. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't. Ah, oh, Jesus. Sorry, I guess mm. I guess I gave it away, didn't I? Sorry. Mm. I I'm done. I feel like I should be half full just to be ornery <laughs> and half full because I really just want to see Kai's reaction to it when it actually comes out. So half full. Oh my God, <laughs> you're a nightmare. You're a nightmare. I hate you. You're dead to me. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> God. <laughs> All right, how about a poll? If if he hang on, if he had stopped before he bought Twitter, right? And and look, so let's be substantive about this for one second, and and then I'll get back to my gut reaction. If he had stopped before he bought Twitter, and the reason I say before he bought Twitter is that um, in buying Twitter and doing what he has done to Twitter, he has disassembled a huge part of the controlling disinformation campaign that social media platforms have worked on for 10 years. And he's just vaporized it in how long has it been since he bought it? A year, year and a half, whatever it is. Yeah. Excuse me. Beer burp. And and that's just, it's, <sighs> it's terrible. Sorry. Another one. It's really, really bad. It's bad for society. It's bad for this democracy. It's bad for the global economy. It's bad for everything. If he had stopped right before that, and and the only thing we had to judge him on was SpaceX and Tesla. I would have gone to see that movie. For real. Mm. I've said this before. But then there's this a plot a twist. <laughs> yeah, well, right. And there's a plot twist. This is a guy who who again before Twitter, if he had is successful at what he was trying to do with Tesla and SpaceX, he literally changes the future of the human race. Hmm. I wonder, I, so first of all, I think that it's, it would be very interesting to explore the co-amplification of Trump and Musk kind of coming mm-hmm. into this phase mm-hmm. around the same time, um, because yep. the Musk of today would not exist as it does to, as he does today without Trump coming into yeah. the, the space the way he did. And Trump would not exist as he does today without Twitter as a platform. And then now this round, Musk amplifying him again. And so these two, um, you know, interesting characters feed off of each other in a very fascinating way. But, you know, I think that it will be very interesting to see what treatment Musk gets in anything. Totally agree. So I totally agree. Yeah. So I'll be half full mainly to watch your reaction, but also uh, because if done well, this could be very interesting as a commentary on, you know, <laughs> what the real life um, villain origin story looks like. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, I don't know if you said this true. It's Darren Aronofsky, who's the guy who did Black Swan. So he's, he's not a schmo director, right? I mean, he knows what he's doing. So mm-hmm. we'll see how it turns out. Yeah. All right. So now we have a poll. So folks who are watching in the YouTube live stream and have the ability to weigh in, um, Kai and I are going to vamp because clearly we're in a vamping mood today and uh, kill time for a bit uh, while you all vote. Please do vote uh, on whether you're half full or half empty on the following topic. Go ahead, Drew. Are you half full or half empty on a one-stop shop app for home buying? Call it an Amazon for real estate. All right, so so I love that interview. Thank you very much. Note to the producers of this podcast: should have flipped the last two. 
Should have flipped the last two. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. The other one was way so, more controversial, and we couldn't vamp is, much longer. Exactly we obviously right. did that, vamp much longer. That, that is the art of producing right there. Uh, so, anyway, <laughs> so, so this is uh, a question based on an interview I did on the radio show this week at some point about why basically um, – we have not figured out a way to disintermediate home buying and make it possible to do it from an app. And yes, you can get a mortgage on an app and you can refi at the ATM and I, and I get all that. But home buying as a as an organic sort of economic event is still really hidebound. And it's really hidebound because of varying state and, uh, and national laws. It's also a challenge because in escrow, you inevitably have a partner such as, oh, just for example, my wife, who insists on reading all of the two and a half inches thick pages uh, of paper that you have to sign when you're an escrow for a house. Love her though I do. Um, so it's really hard to figure out how that all works. And that's why there's no app for that. That's That was the upshot of the interview. I, I, I heard that in the interview, but I <laughs> really struggled to believe that the reason there's no opt for that is just that the paperwork is difficult because it reminds right. me of why we don't have free file with the IRS um, through the IRS. Oh, yeah. It's not because it's so hard. It's because of the lobbying that stopped it from happening. And as we've discussed on here before, the National Association of Realtors is a very powerful lobbying group and has incentives at the local, state, and national level to make to protect the interests of their members. And part of the way that lots of professions protect the interests of their members is by increasing the barriers for people who are not members to do it, whether that means you're a lawyer, whether that means you're a real estate agent, whether that means you're an insurance adjuster, pick your, your thing on a lot of, and they do require skills. They require skills that can be difficult and take time to learn. And, I, and, and maybe I shouldn't have used lawyer because lawyer is very different than real estate agents, but you know what I mean? Anyway, yep. um, there is a very powerful moneyed interest and in very deeply invested in making it very complicated to buy a house on your own. And I think right. that's a bigger reason. <laughs> so totally fair. Anyway, totally fair. Um, let, us, uh, let us close the poll, shall we? Okay. So, what was the question again? Amazon for real estate. <laughs> um, I am, believe it or not, despite everything I just said, half empty. I think that this is actually something that needs a, a bit of a human touch, but I still don't love the way that the model works now. I think that's exactly right. The model is broken, and we saw that in the National Association of Realtors lawsuit in Kansas City uh, mm -hmm. about the, the realtor fees. I agree the model is broken. I'm not sure this is the answer. And the audience, it turns out, actually agrees with us. 70% half empty, 29% uh, half full, which is 99%. Hello, Bridget. That's 99%. It's not 100%. Anyway, full complete, 179 <laughs> votes. I, I don't know why it's Bridget's fault. It just kind of is. You know, <laughs> he just decided. He's just like, blame you know, Bridget. If all else fails, blame gotta, Bridget. It's blame Bridget. It's, it, things have to add up. Could it be Marissa's fault or Courtney's fault? Yes, it could. But Marissa, Mar Bridget's the one who, you know. The buck stops anyway. with Bridget. The buck stops right. with the Bridget. That's right. The buck stops with Bridget. That's right. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, checking my, checking All right. My that is it sure for us. Happy. We got to stop. We've been Bridget's going on. Uh, <laughs> for real, though, Kai, uh, I hope you do something good for yourself for Veterans Day. And, well, uh, and to all the vets out there, I hope that you get some sort of celebration that you actually like that actually does make you feel respected and valued. Thank so you. there's that. that. And that is it for us today. Kai is going to be out on Monday, hopefully doing said nice thing for yourself. I will be back with Matt Levin. And as always, if you have a question or a comment that you want to share, or maybe a little bit of audio for our Thursday show, leave us a voicemail at 508-UB-SMART. You can email us at makemesmart at marketplace.org. This might be the longest we've ever gone, 35 minutes on a Friday. Oof. I guess we had, the, we had some things to say, I suppose. Well, and you had beer for the first time in a while, so. In, in a while. In, 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 a, in, a, in a while. <laughs> Pick Me Smart is produced by Courtney Bird. Secret Today's episode is engineered by Mark Carlos Dorado. Our intern is Neil Farr Shabandi, and I will get my comrades fixed by next week, I promise. Sorry. 
I don't know. These earbuds seem to be pretty freeing for you. The <laughs> team behind our Friday game is Emily McKeon and Antoinette Brock. Marissa Cabrera is our senior producer. Bridget Bodner with a buck stops with Bridget is the director of podcasts. And Francesca Levy is the executive director of digital and on demand. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <sighs>